was diagnosed with anxiety and depression. So, what is it? Let me explain. This is Alicia Elliott, who is a psychiatric and mental health clinical nurse specialist. We asked her about the causes of depression and anxiety. Depression and anxiety is caused by chemicals that we have in our brain when there's not enough of them circulating. We think of the neurotransmitters called serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. Neurotransmitters are chemicals that carry messages in the nerve cells or neurons from the brain throughout the body. These neurotransmitters are held in containers called vesicles within a neuron. The vesicles are then activated by calcium ions and attach themselves to proteins. This action opens up the vesicles and allows the neurotransmitters to be released within the gap between two neurons. Inserting into the receptors of the next neuron, the neurotransmitters send on their message by opening up the ion channels of the next neuron, sending on nerve impulses throughout the body. Nerve impulses trigger emotions, reactions, and feelings. And so it becomes clear that if neurotransmitters are not functioning properly, the body cannot react in the proper way. Those who have depression or anxiety are experiencing a lack of communication between their brain and their body. But is this lack of communication a permanent thing? Not necessarily. There are two main types of depression, major depression and situational depression. The main difference is that if you're somebody with major depression, it's a lifelong illness. Major depression is much more serious and is a constant factor in someone's life. Sometimes, episodes of major depression are experienced for months, or sadly, even years. Suffering a big loss is something that's very important, but it's possible once that loss has passed or that upset has passed that Maybe it's a situational thing where the person would not need to have medication and therapy. Situational depression is not as serious and is usually caused by a significant event in someone's life. The symptoms do not last quite as long. Which brings us to the question of how to know if you have depression. We look for some very specific things when we are seeing somebody that is suffering with depression. We look at energy level, so usually the energy level is slow and fatigue comes very easily. We also look at sleep being affected when you think about the energy level. So many times people are sleeping too much of the time. Other problems that people have with sleep are problems as far as insomnia they're not able to fall asleep, or they're having problems waking up too frequently during the night. We also look at problems with enjoyment. People with depression are not able to enjoy things that they once were able to enjoy, hobbies, school, relationships with each other. Many times also we look at appetite being affected too much, overeating with weight gain, or too little, not having an appetite, and perhaps having some weight loss. But we can see some real negative effects of people that are trying to cope with depression. Things by, like self-mutilation by cutting, or problems with feeling suicidal, or other acting out behaviors. Drug use is common also. We held an assembly at our school to survey the student body about the experience and knowledge of depression and anxiety. What percentage of students do you think suffer from anxiety and depression a year? 85. 70. Like 95%? Uh, I say over 50%. Probably about 50%. Um, like 40%. It's actually 70%. Wow, I would have never thought. 70%. Oh! It's surprised you know it's around 70%. No way! Yeah. Out of the entire student body, about 55% of the students said that they have experienced depression and 75% said they have experienced anxiety. One of the largest differentiating factors between our generation of teenagers and those in the past is social media. We interviewed our students to see what their thoughts were on the connection between social media and depression and anxiety. Does social media have an effect on your mental health? Uh, personally, no. I don't really do social media that much. Do you guys think that social media has an influence on your mental health? Yes. Yeah. I mean, you just see like people out here living good lives and then you're just like, oh, 
must be nice. I think social media has a major impact on mental health because it can show you uh, insecurities about yourself by looking at other people and seeing how they rock what they have and what you don't have. A lot of us are like addicted to it and we spend all of our free time on it. And so by spending all this time on social media, looking at all these like models and everything, oh, I want to be that person. You're like self-consciously not even in, like meaning to like focusing yourself on what you could be instead of like what you are. And first by doing that, you're losing a bunch of friendships because you're spending all your time on social media. In the survey, 15% of the students said that social media has a positive effect on their mental health. 23% said it had a negative effect. And over 60% said that social media has no effect on their mental health. Do you have an adult you feel like you can talk to about anxiety and depression? Yes. Uh, yeah, whenever I'm feeling down or whatever, I just talk to my grandma. She's always been there for me, so she's always been the person I went to. 75% of the students said that they have a trusted source to go to for help when faced with issues regarding their mental health, but still 25% said that they did not have anyone to go to. Out of our student body, that means that roughly 81 students are without an adult that they trust to talk to about their mental health. We ask our students within the last two weeks, have feelings of anxiety and depression affected your school life? Exactly 50% said that it had affected them and the other 50% said that they had not been affected by anxiety or depression. When asked if they have a close friend or family member who had been affected by mental health issues, nearly 85% said yes. One of the best ways to cope with anxiety and or depression is to see a professional. We asked our students who were suffering from anxiety and depression if they had received professional help. 20% of our student body said that they had received help and 35% affected by mental health issues, said that they had not. Following the all-school assembly, Bishop Lewis students from the mass media program decided to take a deeper look into the facts and opinions that everyday teenagers feel regarding their mental health. To do that, they set up a roundtable discussion. Here are some highlights from that roundtable. Basically, this past semester, we've been studying depression and anxiety and how it affects teens, and we wanted to hear what you guys have to say. Uh, about the topic. How do you personally define depression? A state of being where you're trapped and it kind of feels like you're trapped in your mind and it's not necessarily being sad, it's where you kind of can't find happiness even though you're giving you're given all the right reasons to be happy. Or like a lack of motivation, like even just like get out of bed or like talk to people, yeah. it's just like you don't feel motivated to do anything. And what do you think is like and obviously drugs affect your mental state as well as your physical a little bit, so what do you think would be a good, I don't want to say substitute, but like a good... Alternative? Yes. For drugs and a, a positive coping mechanism that could help you feel better instead of using that. Um, I think that in the way that drugs alter your physical state and whatnot, I think that obviously prescribed drugs are not bad. However, if you're abusing drugs in any way, I don't think that's a good option. I think that... Um, Exercise has been proven to release stress in other uh, in other types of anxiety. Um, so, I mean, obviously that works as some coping mechanism, but I don't think that you can fully substitute for the effect that either prescription drugs from your doctor or therapy will help you. I feel like you should just talk to people you trust because trust goes a long way. I feel like sometimes talking isn't really easy, but once you start talking and you just kind of let some stuff out, it does get easier to talk. So what are the causes today of depression that you guys see? I don't think there's really a set cause. I think everybody feels it for different reasons. Can you give us any examples? It doesn't have to be about you personally, but anything that you can think of? We had a moment in my religion class last year, I don't know if you were in that class or not, um, where our teacher um, asked us to raise our hands if we had one, like if we had two parents living in our home with us. And there was probably 26 to 30 kids in that classroom, and I think maybe four or five raised their hand, that they had two parents that were married and together living together in their home. Like, and I feel like that, like, is huge growing up. How has school specifically affected your mental health? 
to get in before I understand that a lot of people see school in a negative light affecting the mental health with anxiety of deadlines, papers, stuff like that. I also, I think that it should be noted, school has helped my mental health actually, I think. With having a structured day where I come to school every day, seeing friends, having that social interaction every class, I mean, I have seven periods a day where I see someone, I usually see a different person in each class and I talk to them and I, I talk about their day and I see that people have found some levels of happiness and I think that inspires me. One way to help with uh, depression and anxiety is obviously the medications that we've talked about, uh, but are there any stigmas around these medications? Um, as someone who's on multiple medications for that, I think there's definitely a lot of times where like if I'm at a sleepover and I go grab a bottle of pills from my bag to take something, they're all like, what's that? And I'll always tell them kind of what it is, but I think a lot of times it's like, oh, you don't need those, or what are those for, like, are those making you act different, are those changing you? I think a lot of times it, they kind of look at you funny, but I've never really felt like there was a stigma around it for me, and a lot of times it's kind of like, oh, you're too young for them, or you, it's just a phase, and a lot of times I think people need to understand that sometimes it's necessary. One of the hardest things that a family has to go through is understanding that it's not their fault when the like us child suffers from depression. It's not the mom's fault, it's not the dad's fault or the kid's fault necessarily. And I think that's why it's so hard nowadays for parents to accept when their kids have to go on medication for things is because they blame themselves <laughs> because they think I could have done better to make you feel better. But it's like what you said, like sometimes you, the chemicals in your brains are imbalanced and you need something to help. How, uh, how do your guys' friends help you through these problems? They're always there to listen and to cheer me up. Like, I have the best friend group around. Yeah, I think that's a good answer. Like, just be a good listener. Like, you don't always have to say something because not everyone wants feedback. Some people just need someone to talk to. Yeah, they definitely don't want to hear, well, here's how you fix it. They want you just to be there with open arms, ready to listen whenever they're ready, and not have you try to, like, get into the situation, and, like, drive it to a certain place and help it when they don't really need that. You should know that you can't always fix everything, and sometimes they need more help than what you can offer which is a huge theme. It took me a long time to understand. It took me a long time to learn that I can't fix everybody. Gabe decided that he wanted to do some more research. So he went online to find a video with testimonials from people who are suffering from diseases like his. When I say my incident and what happened to me, it comes off at face value as very shop shocking in a way. But the way I would describe it is if you look at a word and you say it too much, it starts to lose meaning and the word just looks funny. You know, if you said maybe foot too much, it would start to build a life of its own. And I did that, but I did that with my entire being. So in a world where people are constantly looking at you and you're constantly trying to portray yourself in this light, I overanalyze my being from a third party perspective all too often and then my being had lost its value, I guess you could say. Viewing that from the third party perspective for too long over time, it caused me to get depression and I was diagnosed eventually with body dysmorphia. When I was a child, I remember even being almost like five and looking down at my big baby belly and thinking, why can't I be perfect like these dolls I have or these girls in these movies, it escalated badly. So at first it was, I had to pick all the pores in my face. I had to be perfect. I had to make sure that there were no acne, no pimples anywhere on my face, when in reality that is impossible. And then it escalated to my hair. So that is how I lost my hair, actually, in all actuality. I overanalyzed my hair to a point where I thought I was helping it, when in reality I was harming my hair. And so I ended up just shaving it. My diagnosis came this summer because I became depressed and the body dysmorphia kind of took over and took advantage of that depression because I was overworking myself. But I ended up going to a doctor because my loved ones saw that I was going through something. 
and they diagnosed me with body dysmorphia and depression. I was diagnosed, they put me on an antidepressant and I really had a bad outlook on it at first. It comes down to chemistry and it comes down to the facts and being able to logically think about it and logically think, okay, chemistry in my brain was off and this pill helps me get that chemistry back really, really helped me give rational explanation, rational logic to irrational emotion and thoughts. My freshman year, I um, kind of was at the point of my life where I would just be kind of nervous, like going out anywhere, and it just progressively worsened. It got to the point where I couldn't go out in public without having a straight up panic attack. Like it wasn't just, oh, I'm having a panic attack, I'm freaking out. No, like I couldn't breathe. Like it was hyperventilating and crying and no amount of talking could like bring me down from it. It would take hours. So I was always afraid to tell people about it. I couldn't, I felt like if I told somebody if there was something wrong with me and that they would judge me because, oh, surely no one else feels the exact same way I do. Talking to my mom helped a lot. I know that a lot of people don't have that same kind of relationship, but my relationship with my mom is that I can just, I can talk to her about anything. And so then my mom was like, what is, I don't understand what's going on, what's happening. So we went to a doctor and they diagnosed me with generalized anxiety disorder. And then they prescribed me medicine and I've been on it ever since then. If I'm ever anxious, I have developed my own coping mechanisms that I, I don't really know how to explain, but there's just a way of like talking myself down, knowing, hey, is this rational? No, it's not? Okay, let's think about real life for a second. So just talking myself down from irrational things versus freshman year, I didn't do that. Um, so yeah, I would say it's a lot better. <laughs> Uh, so I struggled with addiction throughout my teen years because uh, my family life was pretty bad. My mom and dad um, divorced when I was young because my father was a violent man. I struggled with alcoholism. And then my mom had a lot of different men come to the home, stepfathers that were equally abusive. So I started uh, dealing with issues at a young age that um, I thought I could fix myself. I started self-medicating at 11 and started using and, and experimenting with different ways of escapism throughout my teen years, but it just kind of snowballed into a place where I found myself pretty hopeless by the time I was 18. I know that everyone chooses to get out of their situation, but I was kind of committed to ruining my life. Um, I was in such pain, but I had one friend uh, who I'd grown up with who, um, after high school, when he went to college, he went to college to study to be a pastor, uh, he, he reached back into my life about four months after we left and went our separate ways. He asked me how I was doing and he knew how I was doing. He, he'd watched me through my addiction and he knew I wasn't well. And he said that extra step, you know, he said, I care too much about you not to do whatever it takes to get you help. And for me, um, I needed somebody uh, and it was a bit of a physical deal. Like I needed him to get up in my face because it was that hard for me to let go of the support systems that I'd created, even though they were terrible support systems. Um, and he helped me to get out of, out of that self-destruction and again, into understanding that there is a, a, a God that loves me and that there is hope if I would ask for it. And uh, I'm now living proof that that worked. Um, it started small with baby steps, mentors, supporters, uh, lots of prayer lots of accountability. One person can make a difference because I, I've spoken to over a million students in my lifetime and it would not have been possible hadn't one friend decided to change my life by asking me some hard questions. So that's how I was able to get free of, of my bondage. For me personally, there wasn't any like huge traumatic event as a child or anything. And I don't think there necessarily has to be to struggle with these things. For me, it was more of like a slow fade and I just, begin to put some of society's filters and society's values onto myself. Just sort of started with some insecurities and um, just sort of a self-awareness of my own body and I wasn't necessarily excited about what I was seeing. Um, and within a few years, it sort of developed into um, some eating disorders, anorexia and bulimia. I feel like anxiety always ran through the core of who I was just that, that fear of never being enough, never being good enough. Once I was able to sort of 
find a few vital connections into things that were life-giving to me, like theater and youth group and things that allowed me to start thinking outside myself and get my focus off of myself. That was sort of, I think, that lifeline that I needed. I struggled still with it, but I didn't feel like I was doing it by myself. So much of it does have to be your own personal decision to sort of want to get better. That's one of the pieces that has to be in place. You have to decide that this is, you know, no longer the way that you want to treat yourself or your body. And then there's, you know, the social support, whether that comes through professional counseling, you know, church-based organization, close friends, family, whatever, wherever you find a healthy support. Again, I think it's really pivotal to not only walking alongside of you, but helping you to get your focus outside yourself and on to some other healthy areas. You know, the first thing I would say to anybody struggling is you're not alone. I would say to not be afraid to put yourself first. To not set themselves up for failure by thinking that they're gonna get it perfect the first time around. Uh, we now know through people like uh, The Rock, um, who had great celebrity status, you know, now that he's talking about his story and we're seeing so many others share theirs, uh, in, the, in the celebrity world that hopefully we, we now realize we're, we're not alone. Those who mind don't matter and those who matter don't mind. The first thing is is that, you know, there's, there's hope and there's full recovery that's possible. But some of you have friends that you know care about you deeply. You know, you've got parents that care about you deeply. You've got teachers, educators, mentors, uh, religious figures that care about you deeply. Um, Tell them what you're really going through. One in five people suffer from mental health illness and five in five people have mental health. So the stigma must stop. Kids like us. We're being touched by the epidemic that has affected millions across the world. We're the ones who have to pretend like we're fine. Like we aren't falling apart. Like we're not just another inconvenience. Kids like us, we exhaust ourselves trying to appear normal. When someone asks, how are you? We say, I'm fine, how are you? Because that comes out so much easier than I feel broken and hopeless and numb. We force ourselves to laugh with our friends, even though we haven't genuinely smiled in months. Kids like us, we learn to never speak how we feel. Because if we talk about it, we're an intention seeker. But if we don't, we're fake. So what are our options here? Kids like us, we're dismissed for feeling the way that we do. Spoken by the people we were told to come to when we have a problem. Well, this is our biggest problem. And because of a stigma that you can't be depressed. You're just having a bad day. You're just moody. You're just stressed. You're just sensitive. We have to push our problems down once more and simply let them turn our souls to rot all because you won't listen to kids like us. And that could be the end of it for kids like us. But only if we let it. So here we are, talking about the issues at hand. Our lives are all completely complex and different, but we're not as alone as we make ourselves out to be. We're all suffering. We're being ignored. We're drowning. But we will not be left behind. There is hope for kids like us. Cross Connections provides biblical counseling and trains lay people in offering biblical guidance. Remedy Live has a group of amazing people who are available 24-7 that are committed to listening to what you're going through and loving you with the hope of God. Phoenix Associates is a group of mental health professionals who are committed to providing therapeutic services to people in need. Get Schooled helps students get to college, find jobs, and succeed in both.
Parkview Behavioral Health has a dedicated team of behavioral health specialists that are dedicated to providing addiction and well-being services to individuals and families in the communities that they serve. Catholic Charities provides services for people in need, advocates for justice, and calls on other people to do the same. Friends and family are always an option. It can be easier to talk to a loved one who is there for you.